Hello and welcome to the Damn Slap Podcast Season 3. Uh, yes, don't mind this, it's part of the props. Anyway, today I am joined by a friend of the show and also a member of the team. Thank you for joining us, Lucy Gerard. Hello. How did I butcher your name? Did I do well? Not that bad. Thank you. Part of my French, jokes aside. <laughs> Excuse my French. Joined also by uh, Team Khoi for fact checking and eventual inputs. Thank you as well. So, first of all, I would like you to explain to the audience what is it that you do at the Dam Slab and that you have been doing, most importantly. Yes. So, what I've been doing, I've been helping with video editing and also production on different projects, including this podcast and the coming up episodes of the cooking show Kill the Culture. Which you guys should definitely <laughs> look out for. It's probably going to be released soon after this, this podcast. Mm -hmm. So, mainly, what was the role in the sense, were you a movie maker? Mm -hmm. Or uh, did you sign up for the overall project design and management? Because <laughs> that's what it's, for me, that's what it's turned into. Yeah, yeah, I signed up for everything. <laughs> I'm happy to help any way I can. But you did have an interest in movie making. Yes. At the very beginning. And as I know, you went to the um, Academy of Arts mm -hmm. in uh, the University of Amsterdam, am I wrong? Uh, at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam, yes. And did you already have an interest in movie making then? Were you already fixed on the idea? Yeah, basically ever since I was little, I knew that I wanted to be a filmmaker, but it concretized itself mm -hmm. <laughs> um, during my studies. That's what confirmed to me this is my calling. <laughs> okay, but you found it as, you, so you applied to to the academy and then you were like, okay, this is exact, like you already had the plan, but it yeah. kind of pushed it further. Yeah, and I didn't really want to go the traditional route by going to a film academy. I was more interested in the um, conceptual, more artistic way of doing things. So when I first started at the Ritveld Academy, it was mainly focused on um, lots of different forms of arts. But then I started experimenting with video and the more I did that and the more I loved it. <laughs> I mean, you said you were really into movie making from a young age. Mm -hmm. The thing is that I've learned through this production as well is that making content, A, is extremely hard and time consuming and challenging in, on several fronts, but also it is so expensive. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, I mean, when you started off, like, did you already know, okay, this is definitely going to be one of the most expensive hobbies or activities I could go for? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, um, one of my family members, uh, she works in the film industry. So I had an idea already of how expensive it would be. And I don't have the same means as she has because she's a professional, obviously. So um, there's producers, mm. there's production companies behind all of that. So I thought, okay, I have minimum means, how am I going to do this? So I saved up money specifically for projects with like side jobs or mm -hmm. uh, government money that I would get from out of the blue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, that's fair game. If the government yeah. gives it, it's a gift. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's for sure an investment to, to work in this industry, but I'm not afraid of that. Yeah. I mean, also, the one thing that people always say when studying about movies, um, I did univer I attended a university last year for movie making as well, mm -hmm. which was really nice. I really enjoyed it. The problem is that it really proved to me that the movie making industry is really man driven in the sense that there is always someone in the head figure that is a man. Yep. And <laughs> ultimately, like, I mean, I say that and I'm a man as well. So, I mean, it's kind of odd, but... No, but I it's good it. that you're aware of it. <laughs> I mean, yes, but it's also like, I, at the beginning I chose not to believe it. I kind of thought, okay, maybe it's a stereotype, maybe this thing, it's just not how it is. Mm -hmm. But over time I got it proved that, yeah, it, it does tend to be that way. So when you signed up to, well, not that you signed up, but like when you made the decision in your mind, were you also aware of the sort of limitations that society kind of imposes on us? Yeah, definitely. And it's also a big part of why I want to work in this industry, because eventually I want to be in the power position that allows me to hire people who are queer, who uh, identify as female, who are part of these communities who are completely left out of this industry or don't have, are not given the same power and the same decision making um, yeah, power. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, a great example of the sort of industry we work in and how it's somewhat mildly corrupt is the idea of um, the Oscars. Remember when they, was it Parasite, the first Asian movie to win an award? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's the thing. It's like, as it won it, I realized that even it was a great movie, jokes mm -hmm. aside, like it was definitely very was entertaining. Amazing, yeah. 
The problem is that because it had this achievement, right, of being like the first Asian movie, people just said, oh, it's great because of that. And for me, it kind of took away from the value of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like rewarding it for other reasons that don't necessarily have to do with mm-hmm. the movie, whilst it deserved its own victory, you know, without any sort of external help. And that's kind of, I think that's a great example to prove that like, yeah, sometimes the industry we work in is definitely not fair for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think for this particular movie, I found it such a pity that everybody kind of took it out of context, this win, instead of celebrating the win of an amazing project. They were like, oh, they won, but they're Asian. So it's like almost not as valid as a win because it's not an American yeah. white powered <laughs> And I saw it as well on Twitter. A lot of people that have, you know, they have platforms as well. And that's, mm-hmm. it means a lot more to me when people have a platform and they speak to them as though they're, you know, speaking facts all the time. So they just go on Twitter and they tweet like, oh yeah, this was just for representation purposes. Yeah. And that's when you realize like, first of all, They're actors or something. How do you know the value of a movie until like, I mean, sure, you were recording a movie. You weren't designing the movie. You weren't Mm -hmm. building it from the ground up most of the time, right? But I mean, they just toss these these ideas and opinions that end up hurting the movie industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'm looking forward to the next Oscars. Maybe it's going to go better. (laughs) I I hope so. Like more people. I don't think there was one uh, person of color besides that Asian movie that won, right? I don't know, let's fact check that though. <laughs> but, so back, back to your experience, what was your first production that you decided to either produce or partake in? Mm-hmm. So my very first production experience was the web series that I created with two of my friends, uh, Mayas Rukel, who's also the co-host of my podcast, and Van Jean. Soft Edges. Soft Edges, check it out. Exactly, <laughs> plug. <laughs> Um, and the, during the second year of our studies in the audiovisual arts department of the Rietveld Academy, we decided, all, all three of us and another friend of ours, to create a web series because we realized that we couldn't get that knowledge and skill practice uh, within the school itself because it's very much conceptual based mm-hmm. and we wanted something more practical and technical. Um, so that was my first experience and we did everything ourselves with zero budget, absolutely zero budget. The first episode, you can tell. <laughs> oh really? I, know, I, I watched it, I personally enjoyed it. Thank you. I mean, if you look at, I think any production, if you start off with like a great production, something is, right, something is sketchy. You either mm-hmm. sold your soul to the devil to get all the equipment <laughs> or I don't know, something sketchy like that. But I appreciate when people show the, the development. Rather than just like immediate, like, hey, it's a 20K production. Yeah, exactly. No, it was a zero euro (laughs) production, but it was so much fun because we wrote the script, we acted in it as well, we produced everything, we gathered the crew, um, and that was a really great experience. And we did two episodes. It took a year uh, or like roughly eight months to Mm -hmm. to film two episodes and produce it and release it and all of that. So that was my first experience, and that was really one of the most wonderful, fun, and stressful, and draining experiences of my entire life. But it gave me also a good idea of um, how I would work within a team, and it helped me also really strengthen my visual identity and the way that I want to do things in filmmaking. And that's the most important thing of our work, I think, is finding the right place. Yeah, and the right people to work with. I was very lucky to find very amazing collaborators, yeah. That's true. I mean, it's, I think the most important thing about productions in general is the fact that like, you, you must have fun doing oh. it. Because the moment you don't, it doesn't only become a job, it becomes one of the most draining jobs. Mm-hmm. Because it's not like you can just go home and say, okay, well, the production will wait until tomorrow. Because some things can't wait. There's so no. many people hanging from so many different things that it's, you just can't do it. So yeah. if you enjoy it, it's a complete fairy tale almost although it is challenging exactly it's always challenging but that's the way that i work when i when i manage a crew when i manage a set my first priority is that every single crew member is having fun is happy has coffee (laughs) cigarettes has croissants or whatever that's uh my priority because if everybody everybody feels valued and is having fun then the production is going to go much smoother even through the chaos and the challenges were there ever like instances where there were clashes between people as in like position wise, like the positions weren't clear or yeah. like direction wasn't clear? 
Because it does oh, happen. Oh, yeah. I, it definitely happened during Cut the Mustard. We actually had to part ways with one of our And Cut uh, the Mustard writers. is your second the, production? Yeah, the web series. The, we, the whole web series, yes. Yes, yes. Sadly enough, we had to, to part ways just because our way of working was different. It's not that, you know... Yeah, it's not so black and white. But no. Because some people see productions as like everyone has a role and it just goes like a, like a hierarchy. But yeah. most of the time, I don't think that's the case, especially nowadays. No, not at all. And I think it's okay also to realize that sometimes you just don't work well with someone and it doesn't say anything about you personally or this person. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person exactly. or they're a better person or whatever. It just means that you, can, you learn more about the kind of people you want to work around and who you can work with um, in a seamless way or almost seamless way. Yeah. How, what would your like, uh, dream team be, like amount of people and sort of expertise? So for the audience at home who, who wants to start their own production or let's say like mi mini movie production, so a 30 minute production, how many people would you recommend? That's a good question. So if it's like a zero euro budget kind mm -hmm, of project, like it's good to have like a small amount of people, I would say five max, but then everybody has to be very versatile and ready to jump in on other tasks and such. And it's important to have set roles, but to also share the different tax tasks together. I would say definitely a role-wise, a production assistant, a director, for sure, two production assistants actually yes. would be great. If it's a, a film-related project, cameraman, sound people, lights people, that's extremely, extremely important. Sure. Extremely. The, the one thing that I haven't seen yet, because a podcast production is rather you have a guest and you, have, you, inter you interact with them and you entertain uh, a conversation, right? But with actors, mm -hmm. that's one thing that I haven't had any interaction with, right? On a, on a set, trying to um, get people to do what you want. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. to me, that, that's, a, that's a huge challenge, especially when you have actors who are trying to deliver lines in their way, but you're trying to frame the picture in a specific way and you have to talk to them and you have to interact. Have you had struggles with actors that came on or did, were they also your friends? Luckily, I never had issues with the actors that we worked with and we were lucky enough to hire professional actors who worked with us on the web series Cut the Mustard. And yeah, we never had problems of attitude or you know talking to them and giving them direction was super easy because probably they were professional actors, yeah. Yeah, so they had, but that's the thing, it's like when it's amateurial in that sense, like even podcasting, it always becomes a problem because people don't know how to behave. Yeah. I didn't know how to behave at all, like the first <laughs> season, the second season, because it's such an odd concept to have people look at you whilst you talk. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> like as an actor, I bet it's even harder because um, I saw some people who are in my course right now who want to do acting but uh, they want to learn media first and they want to find their own path. The thing is, it takes a long time to get used to the idea of portraying emotions through your face and all this. Yeah. And I feel like there's like this ego thing when it comes to acting. There are some people who see like, okay, I'm decent at it, so therefore I'm better already than like anyone mm -hmm. else. So I'm just gonna do what I do and do it best. Yeah, that happens. It's a double-edged sword for sure, yes, but it yes. can hinder a production greatly. Yes. <laughs> Greatly indeed. I mean, ultimately, I would want to talk about your, your second production. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if you could explain it. Yes. So I, for my graduation, I graduated in August 2020. My graduation project was a short film, a short um, psychological thriller um, titled Kaya, uh, which I produced, acted in, uh, wrote, uh, directed. Oh, my God. <laughs> co-directed with uh, Maya Sprickel and Vanny Rujan, my two <laughs> main collaborators. And um, I self-funded it as well. And it was one of the most stressful experiences of my entire life, yeah. not going to lie. <laughs> I mean, just by the sound of it, it sounds definitely yeah. more stressful than the average activity. Yeah, but I'm very, very proud of it, even though it wasn't... It, the result uh, looks very different from what I had imagined, because the thing is, I started production... Uh, right when uh, Corona happened. Yes. So we filmed half of my film in a film studio in Amsterdam. And the first lockdown <laughs> was put in place right when we were filming. So we had a few people drop out the day before because they couldn't come. They were coming from Germany or yeah. whatever. And half of my film had to be completely scrapped because half of the other half of my film had to be filmed in um, Norway. 
Norway. Yes, in Norway, <laughs> in a crazy, crazy haunted house. <laughs> that is that is really cool, but at the same yeah. time, it's so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it had to be canceled because with um, COVID nineteen, yeah. Norway closed their borders. There was a lockdown for months, and so that was super uncertain. So I had to rewrite half of my script, and I filmed um, the other half alone in my basement on my phone. Oh my god, <laughs> that is. That is amazing, first of all. <laughs> Second, I mean, scrapping half of your entire production must have been one of the most horrible moments. I was depressed. Yeah. <laughs> I was so depressed for weeks. I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking to my friend Mayas every day, telling him how I, <laughs> I was going to cancel my graduation. <laughs> I mean, I was, I'm a very dramatic person. So <laughs> well, but half of a production, like, I mean, you know, like a podcast gets slightly canceled and I, I get stressed with no other. <laughs> and then thinking about half of your entire production getting scrapped and having to do it over is yeah. insanely hard. But... What yeah. got you motivated to, you know, pick the pieces and get back to it? Yeah, that's the thing. I really had to think for a long time about what I wanted to do. And I was like, okay, I don't want to take such an extremely different path from my original plan that it wouldn't make sense. So I had to really think about script-wise what would make sense with the very, very minimal means that I had in the moment. And so I came up with a different story for the other half of my film that still fits the original story. And I thought, okay, I want this creepy vibe. I want something that's very uh, suggestive as well so the audience can has space to imagine what's going on on screen even if you don't see anything. Yes. And so that's how I went about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have, a, I have a hot take. I want to know what you think. But yeah. I have this idea about the new version of movies. And what I mean by that is like recent films. You just have more and more obvious storytelling tools. So you just have, for example... It's like everything needs to be explained. Like if it's not explained and it doesn't satisfy 90% of the audience, then it's not a good movie. And mm -hmm. that's like, to me, that's one of the weirdest things because the best movies I've watched are the ones that you have to watch six times mm -hmm. to fully understand even just the main story. Yes. Like, and and that, those are the ones that really impact me on a personal level because you look at it and you're like, okay, there's always a deeper end, right? Some of the superhero movies that I'm seeing now, for example, just out of curiosity and also broken arms, so a lot of time. <laughs> like, I just watch these and sometimes they have to explain you everything. Like, they put a piece of dialogue just so that it's blatantly obvious yes. that something is happening. They're like, this is what is happening. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, okay. But when you were in the art academy, would you say that you encountered many people who were still finding their path? Mm -hmm. Like, they, they had a general idea, just like you in a movie sense, but even more broad than that just like okay i want to do something in the creative industry yeah yeah definitely i mean even for for myself I, I i think i saw a lot of people around me who were still experimenting just like i was doing uh but who had who really found their quote unquote calling by experimenting and by picking up a camera and figuring out that's not what i want to do by sculpting something and being like oh this is more um the path that i want to go for and that was really interesting. I learned a lot by just working around people and not necessarily collaborating, but just looking at them, watching them uh, do their thing, even if it was so far away from what I liked doing. And that's what's really interesting about art school. You have so much freedom to really do whatever you want. Um, and at the same time, this freedom allows you, at least for me, it allows me to narrow down what I really want to do and focus on for the rest of my life. And I saw that happening a lot in my friends as well. Uh, for example, Vani, um, she always knew that she wanted to, to do music, to be mm -hmm. a musician, a singer, but I saw her evolve so much throughout her studies, and by the end of it, her graduation project was an entire album, oh. which is fucking cool, and for my friend Mayas, it was the same. He, he knew that he wanted to be a creative, but he has so many different skills that he's good at that he managed to narrow it down, and now he's focusing on filmmaking as well and other kinds of productions, which is amazing, and which he's really good at. So it's really exceptional to see people grow and evolve and really fi find their calling in that sense. I mean, the, the reason why I also ask is because in a lot of, um, for example, university settings, you choose a course and then they tend to tell you, it's like, okay, this is the most prolific way to go about mm -hmm. it, right? This is the path that you can make a lot of money on. This is the path that you're going to have an easy life with you should probably follow it. They don't tell you to follow it, but they highly suggest it. Yeah. Is that the case in the art academy? No, in Rietveld, 
That was one of the really good things, is that all of my teachers, at least in my department, they were very open and very um, accepting of whatever the students wanted to do. They adapted to each person, person on a personal level to really guide them in a super, super um, customized way almost. So they would never say, this is what you should do because that's what you're good at. Mm -hmm. They would be like, you're good at this, do you want to explore anything else? And that's what I really appreciated about that. You never felt like you, would, you were put in a box. That's amazing. You know, I, I learned through a friend of mine, I had this really cool experience told to me. And I, I always tell it to people because it's the best embodiment of you know, working together. So one of my friends, like he would love to make clay sculpture, like just like yeah. mini stuff out of clay. And my other friend was really into cameras. So what he did was he asked them to, do, to make a stop motion together. Mm. So they ended up making a really good stop motion, right? It's this Amazing. tiny project, but they were known to be creative individually, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever put them together, but because of this group work, they happened to work together and it came out amazing. Like when I watched it, I was, I think I was 16, they were 16 as well, and I watched it and I was blown away, you know, yeah. I was like, they really did this. And stop motion is so fucking hard to do. So tedious. <laughs> it's tedious. awful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the most time consuming also because you have to yeah. take a photo every single frame. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 so good job to them. <laughs> yeah, literally. But I mean, to me, that's one of those examples of like, working together can make something that alone would never make sense. Oh know? yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, you talk about Mayas and he has a lot of skills, but you have a lot of skills too. Mm -hmm. And I know that because you've been working alongside us for a while, right? For long enough for me to get a general idea. Being versatile in the creative industry is probably the key ability, right? If so. you can be versatile and, and adapt, mm -hmm. you can probably succeed. Yeah. yeah. Even if you know nothing of cameras, you can find people who will teach you because you have some skill. everyone has some skills, whether they deny it or not. Mm -hmm. Everyone has personal skills to add to something. Yeah. As, as long as you believe in yourself, really, that's what I tell people. Because oh, yeah, I mean, anybody sure. can tell you, yeah, I'm the pro at cameras, but trust me, there's always gonna be someone else in the world who is definitely better, right? Exactly, yeah. So I mean, you just gotta really believe in yourself and then you can do it. Yeah, but fake it until you make it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's on my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> I wanted to ask you, what's your experience in the Netherlands thus far? Mm -hmm. Do you personally enjoy living here? Do you enjoy the mindset, the people, the also working here? Yeah, I enjoy it. I do. I've been here for now almost six years. Whoa. And that wasn't my plan at all. <laughs> I mean, my plan yeah. either. It's been 10 years, so I, I, I feel you on a personal yeah. level on yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's very different. I, I'm originally from France, so culturally, even though... I mean, the Netherlands is quite close to France, obviously. Yeah, geographically, yeah. Geographically, I don't know about culturally, though. No, culturally, yeah. I think it's very, very different. I, I miss a little bit of the warmth, as much as like <laughs> French people are famous for being arrogant and rude. <laughs> yeah, as <laughs> they say, isolationalists. <laughs> yeah. Like, as in they just like to separate themselves. I think that was a cool term I learned <laughs> last year. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah, and the, the thing is, I do miss from friends this kind of uh, different kind of warmth. Um, I think there's, a, there's something here that gives me a bit more coldness, let's say, when Distance. I meet Dutch people. Although they are very direct, uh, it's a very superficial directness. I find. I'm sorry, Dutch people. Oh, I'm I mean, sorry. the podcast is about you, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. My staff, I love them. We, they know we love them. <laughs> and but it's not all yeah. Dutch people <laughs> before I get fucking... Exactly. No, no. I mean, in today's... Age, I always tell the guests as well, it's like the podcast is about you because... I mean, for example, one of my friends was like, I just don't like them. I just don't have Dutch friends, right? Yeah. And then afterwards, she was like, no, I can't say that. I can't say that. Yeah. And then I thought about it. It's like... But maybe the Dutch people around you are going to look at the podcast and be like, yeah, maybe I was a dick to this girl. Like, yeah. Maybe I should be nicer. In some way, Like I thought that would, that would be it. Yeah, true. But uh, I, do, I do appreciate the, the culture as well. Uh, I, I know quite a lot of Dutch people. And I think I kind of know now to not be shocked by either their, the way that, that they're direct mm -hmm. or the uh, first encounter cold that can come with them. Once you really get to know them, they're a lot more welcoming, for sure. 
Um, but I don't think I want to spend the rest of my life here. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. I would be more than happy to move somewhere else at some point because that was al already my plan all along to just move every five to eight years. So I mean, yeah. that you've uh, you have a whole plan. I mean, <laughs> moving. I mean, I never thought about it like that. But I love to ask my guests as well. Like, where would they want to live? Like, if they had an ideal place in mind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ideal place. That's difficult for me because I want to live in so many different places. <laughs> I mean, with a plan like that, yeah, that sounds yeah. epic. You can literally travel the world in yeah. a matter of sixty years. Exactly. But I would love to live in Vietnam one day because hey. that's where I come from. Hey, hey, hey. Shout out to Khoi. Yeah, shout out to my boy. <laughs> my boy Khoi. Yes, I mean, yeah, Vietnam is, is a beautiful country. With, yes. Like, yeah, I really love the people. Mm -hmm. like, Specific place or? Oh, yeah. no? I mean, I'm from Hanoi, so I love Hanoi. Oh, I know yes. that. Forever Hanoian. He also? needs to be my guide in Hanoi. Because yes. I so was there before, but just for like two weeks. Okay. So I would love to have like a local show around. I mean, I mean, I've been in Hanoi for like, 18 years, so I, sh I think I know more yeah. than you. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that there's going to be a Dan Slap vlog in Hanoi. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. next year? Okay, next yeah, year. Yeah, next subscribe. Year. Yeah. <laughs> subscribe and then you'll know actually. Oh, yes. yeah, it's all about the facts. Oh yes, and then you'll see David speaking in Vietnamese. Yes, you'll oh, hear yes. me with my top class Vietnamese yes. that I learned from Koi <laughs> in uh, a matter of yeah, eight months. Yeah, just, just don't tell the local what I taught you. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I will. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I will. But ultimately, the, I mean, would you ever live in the US? So. I used to want to live in New York, for sure. That was like, ooh, the American dream or whatever. I mean, movie making <laughs> in New York sounds pretty epic. Yeah, but uh, eventually I would love to uh, at some point, maybe for like a couple of years. But I'm also really interested in living in South America, for example, and setting up a production company there and giving opportunity opportunities to uh, artists there, creatives, that would be super fun. Otherwise, I would love to also live in Italy. Hey, hey. you guys heard it here, folks. <laughs> you heard it here live. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know where exactly in Italy. Mm. I've been a couple of times and I think it's a beautiful country. And I love the people there. They're just like, mm. so loud and expressive and that's what I really yes. love. We're yes, very, <laughs> we're very outgoing people just by nature, I mean. Yeah, that's what I love. I think that's what I miss here as well because I'm a shy person and very introverted as well. So being around outgoing people who are like loud and super like, yeah, that it helps. helps me. It helps me a lot. So much, actually. The thing is, like when I went to Rome with some friends from the Netherlands, it was really funny because the way we would order coffee was like, Drastically the, different. All, like, <laughs> obscene. It was so <laughs> funny because they, they walked in and they were like, hello, can I have a coffee, right? Just like the most, just like how I would do it here. Mm -hmm. And I walk in, I'm like in the most dialect and <laughs> I'm like, yo, what's up, my guy? Like, how's it going? Oh, good, chief. I, it's cool. Can I have two coffees like this? <laughs> and without even saying anything, I think I mentioned it in another podcast, but in Rome, for example, you can pay for the next person's coffee. Oh, so nice. if you go to a cafe and you're like, hey, like I only have two euro coin and coffee there costs literally 90 cents, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, you would just be like, okay, just keep it for the next guy. And what's meant by that is like someone who's not as lucky or someone who needs help or anyone, you know, just someone who walks in and he's like, yo, I don't have change. Yeah. Somehow that's paid for by the people. That's super nice. And like, I would just walk in and say that and they would know. And like, for example, my ex-girlfriend said, yeah, he didn't give you change, you know? And that to me is, I was like, no, no, but I told him not to. And she was like, why? You know, and it's like, it's cultural shock, right? Yeah. And that leads to my great segue, David. Thank you. <laughs> but that leads to the next question, which would be, what would you say is the biggest cultural shock you had from coming from France to here? Would mm -hmm. you say it's the coldness or would you say it's like the methodology behind working? Oh, that's interesting. I think it's more on a personal level. For mm -hmm. example, when I arrived here, whenever I was invited to someone's place, I would always bring a little gift, you know, either a bottle of wine or something to say thank you for welcoming me into your home. And when I would give that, they would be very uncomfortable. <laughs> they wouldn't know what to do. They would be like, oh, Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it because so they, it they might think it's like you're you're making them owe you something? I, maybe, maybe I don't know, or just it's just not a practice. But that's also how I was raised. Yes. My parents always, when we're. Uh, invited somewhere gifts like yeah. whatever it is like a fucking candle a bottle of wine anything it's just the idea a card because yeah. that's one thing that uh, me and my french friends and spanish friends and greek friends and mm -hmm. portuguese like yeah. i mean we <laughs> always end up yeah europe. exactly the southern europe block uh, like 
it always ends up being like that. It's like, it's not really about the gift because surely you can put a lot of effort or you can buy something expensive, right? Yeah. But it's, it's more about the idea. The gesture. Right? It's the, yeah, it's the gesture. And it's also just like the, hey, I thought of you before I saw you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which means that there was an idea of, hey, I thought of you just yes. in general. And that's like, that's heartwarming. It is. But yeah, there's two ways to take it because if you receive a gift, you might think, oh, now I need to buy them a gift, which in Italy would be super weird because it's like, <laughs> okay, don't worry about the gift. No, right? it's, it's not really like about it's a, the gift. <laughs> it's a tradition almost. So I think that was the biggest thing. Or even like when I went to like birthday parties and it was the time for like the gifts, I noticed, and again, not all Dutch people. Yeah, please of course, don't I mean, kill it's me. your experience. If you, if you met all Dutch people, you could write a, like, uh, you could go to the parliament and be like, I met yeah, every exactly. Dutch person. You know, that would be epic. But Yeah, but during the gift giving, basically, it would always be really almost awkward because it would be literally, we give the gift and then we're like, thanks, and then the next mm -hmm. one. Whereas, like, in France, when we give a gift to someone, it's a big celebration. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh my god, thank you so much, I love this. We start talking, it's like big hugs, blah, blah, blah. And so I was kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> just like, okay, this is how it is? All right. Yeah, it's almost uh, awkward. And I was like, mm -hmm. should, I shouldn't have brought a gift, maybe? Was exactly. this the wrong thing to do? <laughs> do they but not give gifts in the Netherlands? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there are some instances where like Dutch people give gifts where Italians don't. It's like, um, what is it, the, the Secret Santa? What's it in Dutch? Surprise, which is like the you give like a you get this game. It's like everyone gets assigned the other person, like a yeah. random person, and you have to buy them a gift. There's always a price range, which I thought was really funny as well. It's like it's I'm very not, Dutch. Yeah, right. I'm not gonna spend six hundred euros on a on a gift to like someone, right? I mean, ultimately it depends because it's like let's say like I get Hoy, I might buy something that is like an inside joke between me and him, yeah. and that to me is way more valuable than like an adapter or something. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I would appreciate a personal gift more, but that's one thing that like Dutch people took seriously is that surprise thing, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, you just, you just buy it within the price range, but you buy it, right? Yeah. It's more about the idea of buying it. Yes. And one of the first years where I had it, I got like this deck of cards and it was like a golden deck of cards. And like, I didn't think much of it because I never played cards in front of these people. I never, you know, I never showed any interest. So it was just like a filler gift. But it ended up being useful with the people in the production now. So I guess nice. good gift. Yes, <laughs> excellent gift. Long-term investment. But have you ever played in the surprise thing? No, not really. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're doing that this year. Yes. We're doing that this year, All boys. Right. <laughs> but hold on. We have a set of cards. Yes. Really? No, the golden ones. Remember the one in my house? Oh, yeah. But we've never used it. Yeah, because he doesn't want to... Play oh, yeah. poker with us. He doesn't want us to sell his, our house. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> like, uh, we all know we would lose all our equipment. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm always down for, for a poker game. Yeah? yeah? Okay, poker night. We yeah. can blog it. Yeah, always, always down to lose my kidney. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> you have two. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need one. Nice, nice. But would you ever want to live anywhere else uh, than Vietnam and Asia, per se? Yes, definitely. I mean, Canada is also one of my dream destinations. I've been to Montreal once oh. to visit a friend. Yes, How was it was it? amazing. Oh, it was amazing. And also, people there are just super nice and super you know, friendly in a familiar way. Uh, in French, because they speak French there, of course, mm -hmm. Quebec. Because um, in France, we would say vous, mm -hmm. like you, but like formal to people we don't know. And there, it was always true which makes it immediately so much more familiar. Like, yeah, like linguistically, it's already like friendlier. It's yeah. more like uh, you're already close to me, that exactly. sort of thing. Yeah, so I really liked that. And um, I think, yeah, Brazil. I would love to live in Brazil. Yeah, be one of the most beautiful places on earth. Oh, yes. But you have to have courage to be there, not for the people or anything. It's more like, because if you go to Brazil, you want to see Brazil, right? The entirety oh, yeah. of it. And it's like, and it's, you have to, it, it's <laughs> so big. It's like, Europe is a joke in comparison uh, yeah. to Brazil yeah. alone. Yeah, it's That's a what I joke. mean. It's like, you, you gotta be, it's a completely different dimension than here for yeah. me. It's like, it's like, because Maria also spoke about it on the podcast, episode one, season one. <laughs> she said when she was in Brazil, she would have like, she would really understand that the values of people would be completely different. Like some people would really be like happy, like 
no other, just having a meal, right? And that to her just impacted her really. And then she would just go to like the main cities and realize that, you know, yeah. it was more like, like her approach. So that made me think, it's like, you know, it's, it's not about the country you're in, it's about the setting you're in. You oh, can be sure. like in, is it Sao Paulo? Some pa like Sao Paulo, the city. Like it's, it's just like any other city. And I love the idea that like this comedian once said, he was like, you wanna go to Australia? Look outside. That's Australia. <laughs> you know, it's like the same cities. It's more like you have to go to the center to find kangaroos and stuff, yeah. <laughs> right? And that's the idea. I love that idea of... Um, but the reason why I asked for, uh, for Asia in particular is because I had this, this, this debate with some other guests. I personally wanted to visit Japan when I was a kid, just like every other white kid. But <laughs> the thing is, it's like I, I shifted it to South Korea. Yeah, okay. The reason... Why is that? beyond and above like their advertising campaigns and technologies they implement is preposterous like these people are way ahead like japanese adverts don't get me wrong mad respect for that they make no sense but i love them <laughs> right the advertising campaigns are way above but south korea just technology wise and like the way it's portrayed and everything i gotta see it for myself you yeah. know i gotta see whether it's actually like that yeah definitely I where mean, would you want to go in south korea to be honest first i have to get there like that because yes. I need Hoi to do the whole tour of Asia with me. Oh, yes. yeah. I don't speak South Korean though. Oh no! I mean, look. I mean, fake it till you make it. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, when I first moved to Rotterdam, a lot of people thought I thought I was south, from South Korea. So, I think that's like the first step. And I can also say like hello and thank you in South Korean, which is very fine. What a man! Yes, what um, a man for real. Yeah, like, and round. Uh, yeah, and I can also like swear in South Korean if okay. I want to. Less oh, useful damn. unless like you want. Uh, which makes me kind of like you know like a real South Korean. <laughs> I'll take that with yeah. my ignorance. I will take it as the, the facts. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I mean, uh, one last thing actually. One of the entertaining questions. What are your future prospects from now on? What are mm -hmm. the main goals that you set for yourself, if any? Yeah. Uh, are you well, more of like a day by day person? Because that's also what we got. No, I love, <laughs> I love thinking about what I'm going to do in the future. And I'm someone who's very structured and organized. Mm -hmm. So I like to imagine what I'm going to do. But I'm also very much aware that usually nothing goes as planned. So, <laughs> so I'm OK with any changes and last minute Ups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I would love to continue uh, filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I would love to create more shows, more films, uh, more series that would be completely amazing with you guys. Yes, uh, <laughs> stay tuned for Kill the Culture, you'll find it. <laughs> yes, definitely. And keep working with good people and yeah, expand my creative skills, my creative knowledge, experiment, discover more and more ways of visually telling a story, whether it's fiction or a documentary. That doesn't really matter to me. I just want to learn more. I'm hoping to continue learning until I die, which yes. is probably what's going to happen. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the best way to approach life, in my opinion, because the only thing you really die with are your experiences. You don't really <laughs> die with money, man. Let yep. me tell you that. Mm -hmm. True that. <laughs> <laughs> are you planning to ever work with animations, for example? Um, I mean... I would love to, but I wouldn't be able to do the animations myself, so I would love to meet people who are very good at it, because there is an amazing series on uh, Netflix, mm -hmm. Love, Death and Robots. Yeah, I don't know if I, you've oh seen it. Oh my god, it is oh amazing. Man, it's one of the best fucking animation series I've ever seen in my entire life. And I mean, the so stories good. are so well made, and it's such a challenge to, to make shorts in general, and the different types of animation they that they use each episode amazing. is just incredible. And it's funny, it's dark, it's cynical, it's everything, and it's just perfection. <laughs> I loved it personally because it, it doesn't, like, you know, I, I hate the animations that always have a happy ending, mm -hmm. like that sort of idea, and it's like... The cynical side is that all episodes are kind of a different length as well. So you have some episodes that are 10, some episodes that are 25. And then it's like, since Netflix just plays on, you know, it just plays on, you just kind of expect the videos to be the same length, but sometimes the story cuts yeah. and it's done, you know, yeah. and that's that. And you're left with like this bitter taste. It's like, yeah. oh no, like... On the <laughs> edge of your fucking seat. But they do it really, really well. I just watched their second season, which only has eight episodes. Yes, sadly <laughs> enough. 
<laughs> so I'm looking forward to the second half because I think they probably have 20 episodes, but they just wanted to separate the releases. Yeah, but I always like to think about how many animators had to play a role in yeah. each. Like, I mean, every animation style is different. So if you just took every episode as a different person, it's already way too hard to orchestrate. Funnily enough, when I looked it up, it's actually uh, two or three different teams. Like okay, teams. Small, small oh my teams. God. <laughs> small teams, though. I think I don't remember exactly who it was, but I think it's very, very small teams, and they just do everything on their own. Um, so it's very, very cool. And that proves your previous uh, statement that small teams, but effective, yeah. definitely make an impact. Oh, yeah. And there was another production that you wanted to uh, talk about as well. Mm -hmm. so what was the name? Yeah, the documentary yes. on Netflix, right? Yes. Yeah, it's called Twinster, mm -hmm. and it's actually a beautiful documentary. It uh, revolves around the topic of adoption, because I was adopted myself, mm -hmm. and I just would recommend this documentary to anyone who's interested in also um, the story of just not only adoptees, but just finding yourself and finding um, your, finding out about your own story and puzzling a little bit your life. Uh, that way. I found it super, super emotional. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's Basically, it's the story of twins who were adopted uh, from South Korea when they were younger. And one of them was adopted in the United States and the other one in France. Oh. And they weren't aware of each other at all. Uh, and, but the American twin <laughs> was a YouTuber. Oh, and so what? the French twin found out about her twin through YouTube. Basically. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Subscribe oh, wow. to the damn slap. <laughs> subscribe. To yes. You might find. I might find out I have a brother. Yeah, I think <laughs> I've, I've read about that case, like from Twinster on. Yeah. Somewhere on Reddit. Yeah, it's it's yeah. amazing. Did you see the documentary? Oh, we no, should watch I have, it. I haven't got a chance. You yet. should watch it. Yeah. It's pretty amazing because you see basically the entire story from the moment where she messages the YouTuber and she's like, "Hey, weird question." Where are you from? What is your date of birth? And like, who are you? Yeah. Because I think we look a lot, a lot alike. And they discovered that they were twins. <laughs> wow. And they meet and everything. And it's, uh, it's just really emotional. But they have this instant connection because, of course, twins and, of course, like finding a sibling on the other side of the planet when you were oh adopted. It's pretty amazing. So, yeah, but I, mean, I recommend it's that. It's with scenarios like these that it's like, how, first of all, how do you even approach someone? It's like, hey, I think might be related yeah. <laughs> especially when someone is like a youtuber or someone mildly famous even uh -huh. it's like you take everything with a great as a with a grain of salt yes thank yes. you Good one. <laughs> as a grain of salt so just like a fat grain of salt just chilling there <laughs> a massive one no but like i mean you you know also you choose to believe that nothing is true online and that's a wise way to take the internet don't believe anything online guys never ever but um Believe these, <laughs> for yeah. example, like serious content where someone actually spills their guts out to you. Yeah. You should probably at least acknowledge it. Yeah. Because it uh, might have a, some parts might be true. Yeah, yeah. and I think in, in this case, it's pretty amazing because the, the, one of the twins actually produced the whole, the whole documentary and it's Wasn't filmed very raw. Hmm? Was it the YouTuber that produced the... Yeah. Okay, no, no, for a second I was like, yeah, I mean, YouTuber, you're already halfway there. Don't make the other one do it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Be like, yeah. No, because the other one worked in fashion, okay. basically. So it's both creative fields. Wow. So and they were wow, both like, well off as well. Yeah. So there wasn't like a disparity between, because that's what sibling rivalry, right? It's like yeah. it tends to occur that one tends to try to be better than the other. Yes. So I can only imagine once you meet someone that is related to you that you haven't had a challenge with, mm -hmm. You immediately compare yourself with them, mm -hmm. right? But if you chose different paths, that's okay. That's at least yeah. better in some way, right? Yeah, exactly. Better. But it's a it's a beautiful story, so I would highly recommend it. And it's just the story that really touched me as someone who was adopted as well. Yeah. Would you say that you're willing to look for your past as well, for your origins? Definitely. And funnily enough, I never thought about it until four years ago. Before that, like I had zero questions. Like, it's okay. so fucking weird. I never looked into my adoption files, nothing, never asked questions. I was totally at peace with that uh, because I have this uh, love and respect for my birth mother for taking the decision, the difficult decision to a, part ways. And I would never want to like hurt her in any way. I would never go look for her and try to contact her, but I would look for the history. I would love to find out who she is mm -hmm. and eventually who my birth father is. But I would never contact them out of respect because they made that decision and 
I don't want to disrupt their lives oh. in a really, you know, what could be a really painful way. I never thought about it like that, but now I realize how selfish it, like my perspective was. It's oh, like, well, no, just find your path, just find the path. <laughs> just be like, oh, hello, what's up? Like, I don't think it's selfish. A lot of people do want to find their parents, and that's completely fine, and I think that's a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I encourage it if that's something that could help healing part of the um, potential pain that someone who was adopted can, can feel. Uh, but for, from, for myself, mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to meet my parents. I just feel the need to figure out a little bit of what happened. I have very little information uh, about my birth mother, just little stories that were told to uh, my parents. I call them my parents, not my adoptive parents, because I don't like using that term. They're my parents. Um, but that was told to them at the orphanage, so I'm not sure if it's fiction or not, but the nuns told my parents that my birth mother was very young and that she was alone, that she was tall for a Vietnamese girl. <laughs> okay. So that's the extent of the information yeah, that I have. Yeah, that's not a lot of information, especially no. because it's not even written down like someone yeah. gave it, I mean, the orphanage claimed. Yeah. And she had like the most common last name in Vietnam. So oh, it's Nguyen? <laughs> Nguyen? Nguyen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, good luck finding her. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very common. Yeah. I think yeah. we read that 40% of Yeah, 40%. 40% yeah. of Vietnamese. Millions and millions of Vietnamese people have this last name. But yeah. it's literally the most common surname in Vietnam for sure. But like, I mean, is it even bigger than that? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But what does it mean? Johnson, John, <laughs> Davidson, something like that. Smith. Smith. <laughs> yeah, Smith, Smith is pretty. Yeah. It's yeah. the equivalent of Smith in Vietnam. That's for sure. Smith? Yeah. We are, we are One last thing, I, I learned through Hoi recently that like a lot of international students that come from any Asian territory, they tend to shift their names so that people like me can pronounce their names. <laughs> Is that the case? So would your name be Lucy in Vietnamese as well? No, no, you, no. Like, I had a different Vietnamese oh, yeah. name. I know your Vietnamese name yes, from your Gmail account. I can't pronounce um, it. It's Bao Tho. Oh. Yo, that's... Yeah, I don't think I can pronounce it. Never mind, let me relax. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even pronounce it like Jared without making a fool of myself. So like, you I know. can't pronounce my own Vietnamese name. That's like embarrassing, but you're um, going to teach me. Yeah, it's Bao Tho in Vietnamese. I think it means like a, a rare treasure or like a very, a very precious treasure. There you go. Yeah, actually yeah. it was given to me by the nuns at the orphanage because when I was an infant, the white of my eyes had a little bit of blue tint. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is epic. Like a gem, I think. So they, yeah. they gave me that name. I've been watching too many superhero movies not to see that as a mad hit. <laughs> <laughs> there must be something laying there. She's our superhero. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, she's definitely our superhero. I'm fucking Thanos. <laughs> yeah, you just snapped my production in half. Oh no! <laughs> oh no, opening wounds. Oh no, but... Well, thank you first of all for your time and for joining our production yes. and being one of thank the most you. helpful hands we have ever received. Thank so you. Thank you from our entire production. Yes, yes, we can all agree. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, with that, I think today's podcast is over. But uh, do make sure to check out our socials and most importantly, memory stains. Yes. <laughs> so if you could just quickly explain what memory stains is. As yes, memorystains.com is my website. You can find my portfolio there. And this is also where you can contact me for business inquiries for memory stains productions is my company. So check it out. <laughs> definitely. It's well, my shirt, you put it on, on the screen. Yeah, it's definitely on screen now. Yeah. Swipe up, whatever. <laughs> yes, yes. I love the design, by the way. It's super Thank nice, you. super calming. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you guys a nice day and uh, until the next time. Bye. Peace.